Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Scott Deluzio. He is an Army veteran, having served six years in the Army National Guard. Both he and his brother were deployed to Afghanistan, and his brother was unfortunately killed in action. Since then, he has authored a book and hosts a podcast connecting with other military members. So Scott's got a lot of things that he can talk about with his life, and I'm looking forward to getting to know him more today. So Scott, thank you so much for being here. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your story? Well, thank you, first off, for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity to come on your show and share my story with you and your audience. Um, But like you said, uh, I am an Army veteran. I served about six years in the Connecticut Army National Guard. Uh, In 2010, I deployed to Afghanistan. uh, And my younger brother, as you mentioned, he was deployed as well to Afghanistan uh, during that deployment. And... uh, Tragically, he was killed in action. So uh, after coming home from Afghanistan, like a lot of other veterans, I dealt with uh, a lot of the struggles that come with coming back from combat, the PTSD and and survivor's guilt and things like that. Um, but I also had the, the grief of losing my brother, my younger brother, and dealing with all of that on top of the PTSD and trying to readjust back into uh, civilian life, not being in a combat zone and, and things like that just made things so much harder. Um, and after a while of struggling on my own, not getting the mental health help and things like that that I uh, definitely needed, I uh, eventually figured out that I needed to go and, and get this kind of help. Um, but I also realized that there were other veterans out there who were struggling Uh, in a similar way to what I was dealing with, and they weren't getting the help that they needed either. And so that was a spark for me to start my podcast um, to basically highlight some of the issues that veterans are facing and talk to uh, veterans about what they've gone through, how they've worked through the struggles, whether it's PTSD or substance abuse or homelessness or any number of different things that they uh, could be dealing with, Uh, to let the other veterans who might be listening know that they're not alone in whatever it is that they're dealing with. Because oftentimes we will isolate ourselves and we will get away from the community or the group of people that we tend to hang out with. And we'll just think, oh, well, this is just my problem. No one else is going through this. And when you hear that someone else has gone through this and not only has they, have they gone through it, but they've, uh, they've, excelled afterwards after they figured out how to get through it um, it gives hope to the people who are out there listening so so that's where uh, my my podcast came from um, really just as a way to give hope to the veterans who are out there struggling Um, and my book uh, was written uh, again the book surviving son was written to uh, basically tell my story and my time in afghanistan and what it was like to be in combat to lose my brother uh, while I was deployed overseas and what I dealt with coming back home. So really it's designed to uh, help other veterans realize that there are healthy ways to deal with the problems that they're going through and also to let the people who never served to know that there are some sacrifices that are made by the service members and, and their families uh, in you know, whatever it is that, that uh, they they do in service to this country. When I first, of course, want to thank you for your service and, of course, your brother as well and everyone that you've met and talked with, like, of course, so appreciative for all that you've done. Um, and it's great to hear that coming back when you realized what you were going through, that, like, you weren't alone and you wanted to help other people. So would you be able to kind of take us back first to why you even wanted to serve and join the army? Yeah, sure. So uh, my brother and I, we were both raised in a very patriotic family. Uh, We grew up uh, respecting the military and first responders and and people like that. Basically, anyone who put the uniform on uh, 
whatever that uniform might have looked like, whether it was military fatigues or police officers uniform or EMTs or uh, firefighters, whoever it was, they're basically going out every day, uh, potentially putting their, their lives on the line for complete strangers. And uh, we grew up knowing, uh, especially kind of at the tail end of the Cold War, that there were dangers in the world and bad people want to do bad things to good people. And these people are out there willing to protect the good people from the bad people. And, and it was really brought up to us in that kind of black and white night and day kind of, uh, kind of thing. And so growing up, we, we always just respected uh, people like that. And I, I remember actually when I was, uh, I don't know, eight or nine years old, I went to an Air Force base uh, when the troops are coming back from Desert Storm. And it was like I was meeting like the biggest celebrities and it was you know it's just regular soldiers coming off the the planes and stuff and it was like like this was so cool and i, I still remember it to this day and this is, this is over 30 years ago um that that this happened but um you know i i just was so kind of in awe of that um and then uh, fast forward a bit 9 11 happened um i was in college my younger brother he was still in high school and I had considered just dropping out of school right then and there uh, when 9-11 happened to go join the military. Um, but I also knew myself and I knew that if I was to just drop out of school right then and there, that I probably wouldn't go back and finish my degree. I, I would I would have lost out on that, that opportunity because I, I just knew I, I wouldn't start back up where I left off. Um, so I decided I only had a couple of years left, so I'd, I'd stay in, finish up my degree. And whatever military operation was going to happen after 9-11 was probably still going to be going on. And I'd reevaluate things after that. Um, my brother ended up actually joining the military first. Uh, he ended up going to a military college up in Vermont called Norwich University, which is where the ROTC was started. Um, and he met a guy up there who was in the Vermont Army National Guard and got talking to him. And he's like, oh, you know, that sounds like the thing I want to do. And so he decided to uh, join the Vermont National Guard. And basically overnight, my little brother, who I would roughhouse in the backyard with and get in trouble with his kids and everything, he became one of these guys that all my life I was looking up to. And and I was like, holy crap, this is awesome. Like, like I'm super proud of him for doing this. And I just had like a whole new respect for him uh, af after he did that. And a few months later, I heard this report in the news that said that the military was struggling to meet the recruiting numbers that year. Uh, and this was, I don't know, sometime the year after my, my brother joined. And it got me kind of frustrated, a little angry. And I was like, where were all these people who, like right after 9-11, people were ready to go kick some ass and, and go uh, get some payback, right? And where where were all these people? This was only what, three or four years after 9-11? Like, did that sentiment really drop that quickly? And I said, well, you know, what, what happened to all these people? And then I realized I was one of those people and I still hadn't done anything about it. And, uh, you know, I'd never joined the military. I'd never had any anything like that going on. And so I thought to myself, why don't I join the military? And all the reasons not to were all just poor excuses. Like, oh, I have a... I have my first job out of college and I have this going and I have that going. It's like, well, who cares? There's a lot of people have things going. Um, but I'm, I was young enough. I was fit enough. I was, I was perfectly capable of doing the job. And so I said, okay, well, enough of that, no, enough excuses. I'm going to just join and, and go serve. So I ended up joining the Connecticut Army National Guard, which allowed me to uh, for the people who aren't familiar with what the National Guard is, it's kind of a part-time uh, soldier. So you, you train one week in a month and two weeks a year. Uh, you can be deployed and you can be activated for uh, other kind of service like that. But uh, generally, it's one week in a month and two weeks a year. So you still get to work your civilian job, which was great because I was able to uh, keep that job that I had uh, just started uh, about a year earlier, uh, my first job out of college. And it didn't really seem right to me or fair to them to just stop working that job. And so I kind of wanted to have the best of both worlds. And this allowed me to do that. Um, and after hearing my brother's experience, I was like, okay, well, if 
my little brother can do it. Of course, I'm, I'm not going to let him one up me. So of course, I'm going to be able to do it too. So, um, so that's, that's really how he and I both got into the military. And, um, you know, where, where that journey started. That's really great to hear how all of that went down. So then what was it like being deployed? So the deployment was interesting. So uh, before we deployed, we, since we weren't active duty soldiers, we had a bunch of pre-deployment training things that we, we did um, just to kind of get us up to speed. Not that we weren't already uh, training the, the right things that we needed to do, but it was just to make sure that, that everyone was up to speed on all of the, the maneuvers and all the different tactics that we needed to do and uh, trained us on some of the local customs and traditions of the place we're going to go to. So we don't end up starting a, a cultural war or something because we said the wrong thing or did the wrong thing or whatever, or address someone the wrong way or whatever, you know, you don't want that to happen when you go to a foreign country. Um, so we had all that kind of training and, um, just before, um, we left for Afghanistan, my wife was pregnant and she gave birth to our oldest son. And so I had a lot of changes going on in my life at that point. Um, I, I had just gotten married about a year and a half earlier. Um, my first son was born just before going to Afghanistan and then I left. And so I became a father, I became a husband and a deployed in a combat zone all within about a year and a half of of them and so a lot of things were going on in my life at that time so it, that was kind of tricky um for my parents and the rest of the family it was uh pretty difficult to have both my brother and i deployed at the same time uh previously my brother had deployed to iraq and so they were kind of familiar with what to expect from someone being deployed but this was the first time that two of us were deployed at the same time and that was rather stressful for them to have to have to deal with all of that, uh, you know, not knowing what was going on with us and, and everything. Um, when my brother and I were in Afghanistan, we were on separate bases. So we never saw each other once when we got to Afghanistan. Uh, we actually never even talked to each other when we were there. Uh, not not for a lack of trying. It was just with our schedules and the things that we were doing, we just never got the opportunity. So really the only way that we got to hear about what each other were doing was uh, by playing the telephone game. I'd call home, talk to my parents, tell them what I was doing. And then they'd talk to my brother, tell tell him, relay messages and vice versa and stuff. So so that was kind of the, um, you know, how, how we were able to communicate and everything, which was, which was kind of awkward, but it, it worked, I guess. Um, as far as our job, when, when we were over there, my brother and I both were infantrymen. So if you're not familiar with that, that's kind of more the frontline fighting troops, uh, the, the ground troops. Sometimes we call them the grunts, uh, just kind of affectionately call, call each other grunts because we do the grunt work. Um, and, uh, our job, uh, we were stationed right on the Pakistani border, about two miles away from the border. And we had the mission of securing this uh, particular border region where uh, about 80% of the NATO supplies would come through uh, from Pakistan into Afghanistan. And the reason why they came through there is because Afghanistan's a landlocked country and Pakistan had the closest ports. So a lot of the cargo would come in on cargo ships, dock in Pakistan, get on a truck and drive its way through. So we had to basically secure the border area to make sure that uh, the, the trucks had free passage to get through the border and get into the country and everything like that, because there could be you know, terrorists who decided to blow trucks up or um, even the Pakistani military would shut down the border from time to time. So us being there kind of uh, served as a little bit of a deterrent to that uh, so that they would keep the border open. Um, but but that was our primary job while we were there. Uh, we also had other uh, missions where we would go out to uh, these remote villages and we would uh, go and engage with some of the locals, the, the village kind of leadership, they call them the village elders, like the, the older people in the village tended to be the, the ones in charge of things. Um, so we would go talk to them and just make sure that, uh, you know, we were working with them and providing that goodwill to them so that they could help us out and we could help them out, vice versa. Um, uh, and other times we would go out on missions with the Afghan army uh, to basically train them 
on how to conduct some of these operations on their own. And we would go looking for Taliban activity in some of these uh, villages, looking for weapons, looking for uniforms, uh, like sometimes the Taliban would steal Afghan army uniforms and they'd use those to kind of infiltrate the Afghan army and, and wreak havoc on, on things that were going on there. Um, but uh, so we would go through these villages and we, we'd work alongside the Afghan army. Um, and so it was, it was interesting working with another uh, country's military um, just to see the, the difference in the training that they had and uh, the lack of just basic understanding of keeping your, your rifle clean, for example. Like if the rifle gets caked up with dirt, it's not going to shoot very well or at all. And they didn't pay any attention to that most of the time. And so it was like we had to just teach them like the very basics, like baby steps to, to get them to uh, even be somewhat functional. And, uh, you know, once once when we got through some of that, it was OK to work with. But it was just a, a completely different experience because we came from a military that's very highly trained and very motivated to complete the mission. And they had a lot of volunteers with very little training who weren't quite as motivated to complete their mission. It was kind of like, this is my job and I'm going to come here. I'm going to check in, uh, clock in for the day. I'm going to clock out at night and what you get is what you get. And, and that was, that was just an interesting, uh, dynamic between the two armies, you know? Yeah, that sounds very interesting that to be thrown into that sort of situation where it's not, it's not where you're used to. It's not like you, you know, grew up idolizing the military and the service that people were doing. So to then see another country doing it completely differently must have been very different. It, it was for sure. And one of the biggest challenges when we were over there with training the Afghan army was uh, during the uh, Muslim holiday of Ramadan, which during, during that year, it, it changes uh, year to year when, when it happens. But it was around August, like July, August that, that year that we were there. And Afghanistan is extremely hot in the summer. Um, like easily daily temperatures are over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. It's it's just really extremely hot. And during Ramadan, uh, Muslims are not allowed to eat or drink at all during like the daylight hours. And so when you have a group of uh, Afghan soldiers who are not allowed to eat or drink anything during the day, and you're trying to get them outside to do some sort of training in the sun, in the heat, you may, you're lucky if you get an hour out of them before they want to just go hide in the shade and not do anything. Uh, and quite frankly, I can't blame them because I couldn't imagine doing anything in that kind of heat with no food, no water or anything like that. I, I'd be a lifeless corpse on the ground if you asked me to do anything like that, you know? Um, and so when, when they would just kind of wander away, we were like, okay, well, what are we going to do with the rest of our day? And it was almost like herding cats. Like you're not going to get them all back into one place at one time. They're all just going to kind of scatter. And we just had to make do with what we had to work with. That's great though, that you were able to kind of adapt and figure out what is the best way for the situation. So would you be willing to share a little bit about what it was like to find out that your brother had been killed? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, that, particular day that my brother was killed, uh, we were out on one of these missions with the Afghan army and we were going through this village and just conducting our, our mission, looking for weapons and other signs of Taliban activity. Um, if we met any resistance, we were to try to detain people if we could. Um, and so that was kind of our mission. We were just kind of looking around throughout this village. Uh, and I got a call on the radio uh, partway through the day and someone told me that the commanding officer was looking for me. And usually if anyone knows anything about that chain of command, usually if the commanding officer is looking for uh, an enlisted soldier like that, it's usually because something either really, really good happened or something pretty bad happened. And I was just running through what I had done that day. And I was like, I'm not getting any medals for what I had done this day. So something pretty bad must have happened. 
what did I screw up? What did one of my soldiers screw up? <laughs> what went wrong? And so I'm going through my head trying to retrace my steps, retrace the things that I said to different people or the, the things that I did or uh, the things that some of my soldiers did. It's like, what went wrong? I couldn't figure it out though. So I'm all nervous and I'm, I'm, I work my way uh, back up this mountain to where the commanding officer was and I eventually linked up with him. And I'm like, okay, um, I'm just preparing myself for the ass chewing of a lifetime because I, I don't know what's going on, but it's not going to be good. And so I meet up with him and he tells me to come over like kind of off to the side away from the other soldiers. And he tells me to take a knee. And, um, so I, I did, and, and I, I'm sitting there and he says, uh, your brother's unit was ambushed and he got hit, uh, in, in, during this ambush. And up until that point, it had never occurred to me that my brother could be seriously injured or killed at all during this deployment, which is stupid if you think about it, because we were like the frontline soldiers who were doing the bulk of the fighting. Like, of course, that's a possibility. But I think it was just like a defensive mechanism for myself where I wasn't going to allow myself to believe that either one of us would seriously be injured or killed because how could I possibly, as an older brother, how could I possibly do my job if I'm worried about him this whole time? And so so when he said that, that my brother had, had been hit in this ambush, I was like, okay, well, let's figure out the logistics. How do I get to him to be there for moral support or if he needs blood or something from me that I could, I could offer to him, like get me to him and I'll, I'll do whatever I can to, to help him. And the, the commanding officer looked at me all like, a, like I had three heads or something. And he's, he's like, I don't think you understand he's, he's been killed. And as soon as he said that, it was like getting a punch in the gut, like the air just sucked right out of me. And I started to think about like, the possibility of life without my brother, which was prior to that moment, was not a possibility that I had ever entertained. It just didn't occur to me that he wouldn't be there until we're old and gray and, you know, old, grumpy old men sitting on a porch yelling at kids to get off our lawn or something, you know, um, just never occurred to me. And so I naturally, I, I broke down, I was crying, I was, I was just a wreck. Um, the commanding officer asked me if I was going to be okay. Like, was I going to hurt myself or other people, which was a perfectly valid question to someone holding a loaded rifle after getting this, this terrible news, um, struck me as it struck me the wrong way, but it, I totally get why he asked the, the question. Um, and, uh, about 20 minutes after I found out that my brother was killed, our own unit started, uh, coming under attack from the village that we just came out of. Um, clearly the Afghan army who was taking the lead on this, this mission didn't do a great job finding all the weapons because there were uh, RPGs or rocket propelled grenades. Uh, there were uh, AK 47 fire and stuff that all coming towards us from this village. And so not only was I now grieving, I now literally had to go and try to fight and, and be a soldier and not, not be uh, this grieving brother, which I clearly was. And I had this wave of anger come over me. And I, I just wanted to kill all of those people who were fighting against us. Cause I was like, these are, well, it's not the same exact people. Like these were the people who were involved with killing my brother. And I just wanted to go and go and kill as many of them as possible. Um, and, and I know that sounds awful. Um, it, you know, think about it now. I, I know how it sounds. It is awful. Um, but it was just that, that raw emotion that I had. It was just anger. It was everything that was, was just so terrible, uh, going through my head. Um, but then I realized if I was to do something stupid like that and just, I don't know, Rambo style, run down the mountain and go start shooting at people, uh, I wasn't going to make it out alive. And so then my parents would have, uh, you know, two knocks at the door saying, Hey, both of your sons were killed. My, my son would grow up with a father. My wife would become a widow. The soldiers who I was supposed to be leading would then have to probably go figure out a way to retrieve my body down there. And that would probably get them either really injured or killed. And 
that wouldn't be okay with me either. So, you know, I was like, all right, how do I do this? How do I figure out how to stay um, in this fight without causing more harm here? And so I said, I need to just put my personal issues aside. The, the fact that I lost my brother, I have to just stop worrying about that and stop thinking about that right now. I have a job to do. I have soldiers to lead. I need to go and do that. Um, that's the best thing that I could do right now. And so that's what I did. I, I went and uh, linked up with the rest of my squad and figured out where everyone was, was situated. I, I provided the leadership that they needed. And, um, you know, we were successful in repelling this attack so that we, we didn't um, sustain any further casualties or, or anything like that. So, um, so that was, that was all within, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes or so of finding out that my brother was killed. And so as intense of uh, a time it was for me to uh, be deployed to Afghanistan after having just become a father, just gotten married and all that kind of stuff. That day was like a thousand times more intense because it was literally finding out my brother was killed and then being in a life and death situation myself. And it was by far the worst day I've ever experienced. And, uh, you know, I, I hope no one ever has to experience a day like that. Um, you know, and, and I hope I never have to experience anything like that again, but, um, it, it did show me that like what I'm capable of doing. If I, if I'm able to just put my mind to it, I can literally fight through the worst possible day you can imagine. And, um, you know, so that, that does give you a little bit of, uh, you know, mental strength anyways, knowing that you have that ability within you. Definitely. And for you to be able to talk about that day now and the way that you are and to like realize like your natural reactions, like looking back, you're like, wow, but also like you understand why you had that reaction. So it, it makes a lot of sense. So now when did you end up leaving Afghanistan? Yeah, so the day that he was killed, um, after that firefight, I was flown out of that village. Uh, they, they had a helicopter come and pick me up, along with a couple of the soldiers who were injured that day. Um, fortunately, no serious injuries. It was more like ro rolled ankles and, and that kind of thing. Um, the, the landscape and terrain over there is very rocky and loose rocks and stuff, so really easy to roll an ankle over there. Um, and so... They flew me out of there to uh, Bagram Air Base, which is like the main air base. Um, it was in the news a lot uh, last summer when the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan took place. Um, uh, that, that was like the main air base that people were trying to get people out of and, and things like that. Um, and so they flew me there. Um, that also happened to be where my brother's body was taken uh, after he was killed. And... Uh, I met with the uh, leadership there and, and kind of got a feel for what the next steps were. Um, I was able to get on actually the same plane that my brother's body was going to be on uh, the next morning to fly out of Afghanistan. Um, and so it was all less than 24 hours from the time that I found out that he was killed to the time that I left Afghanistan. Um, that flight took us to Kuwait, uh, where, um, where I took another plane to Germany, then to Atlanta, and then back to uh, my home in Connecticut. Um, and so all of that took place in uh, about 48 hours from the time that I found out that my brother was killed to the time that I actually got home, uh, roughly 48 hours, maybe maybe a little bit more, depending on you know, time with layovers and, and things like that. But um, so I was, yeah, I was home relatively quickly. I mean, uh, most people uh, who've been deployed overseas, they'll tell you if they're going home on leave or, or something like that. Usually, it could take them a week or so to get home just because they're waiting for flights and everything. But given the circumstances of what happened, I actually got bumped up on a lot of the flights. So I was I got to a place like I got to Kuwait and within uh, probably an hour or two, I was on the next flight on my way out of there. So, um, you know, it, everything just moved much quickly, more, more quickly for me because it, it, they just bumped me ahead to, for everything. So, 
Um, you know, I was I was very fortunate as far as that went. Um, the the problem though was when I was uh, told that I was able to leave Afghanistan and be on the same flight as my brother, I wanted to escort him the entire way home. Um, when we got to Kuwait, I actually had to part ways with him, and, and he went. Uh, I think there's like a, a autopsy thing that they do there, and, and they do that kind of stuff. Um, but I couldn't stay for that um, that type of thing. Um, but in the military, there's there's a saying that you never leave a fallen soldier or a fallen marine or whatever whatever it happens to be another fallen comrade, if you will. Um, and to me, I felt like I had already failed my brother by not being there for him when we when he was killed and i felt like the least i could do is be there and escort him the whole way home um but they didn't allow me to do that and looking back on it now it makes sense because i i was a whole lot more good to my family back home than i would have been to him i mean there's nothing i could have done for him to make him any more comfortable any less dead or <laughs> whatever so it like it made sense that I went home, but it, it just ate me up inside that I couldn't be there for him. And so, so that was difficult for me. But, you know, when, uh, when I got home, it was, it was good to be around family and, and that I realized that at that moment that it, that was the right decision. And so then after that, did you end up leaving the service? Yeah. So, um, uh, one thing I didn't mention about that day, um, uh, was, when we flew out to that village uh, earlier that, that morning uh, that I was doing that mission at, um, the helicopters that we were on, uh, so it was pitch black at night, and we had night vision goggles. And if anyone has ever worn night vision goggles, you know that there's very little depth perception with them. It, like, it's it's really just, like, have you ever seen it on television, like the green, uh, you know, silhouettes of people? Like, that's pretty much all you see, and there's no real depth perception. Um, and so... When the helicopter was coming down to land, uh, I was given the signal to get off the helicopter, and I was the first one to step off. Um, but the helicopter was still about three or four feet in the air. It hadn't fully landed yet. And I had, uh, in addition to my rifle and my body armor and my helmet, I had a, a rucksack on my back, which had probably close to 100 pounds of stuff in it, in addition to all the other stuff that I was carrying. And... I stepped down, expecting to step directly down on the ground, and I totally busted my knee on as I was coming down off of this this helicopter, um, and I, I totally screwed that up. So um, after I got home, I went to the doctor to get a consult to see like what was going on with my knee. Eventually, figured out it needed surgery, and the surgery was going to uh, require rehab that was going to last for about nine to 10 months or so. And that would have brought me up exactly to the end of my enlistment, uh, like right to that last month that I was going, going to be in. And I continued to go to training the, you know, the one weekend a month, uh, two weeks a year, that, that kind of training. Um, but I couldn't do anything because I was on crutches and I, I literally couldn't do any of the training that we were doing, and I felt useless. Um, I'd literally just sit there and watch everyone else run around do whatever training that we were doing, and I felt completely worthless. And it was around that time that I, I started thinking to myself, like, do I really want to stay in the military, or am I going to be done after this enlistment anyways? And so I started, and I realized that I, I wasn't going to stay in the military. Um, my Family had already sacrificed enough as far as I was concerned uh, with losing my brother. And I just saw it in my, my parents' eyes every time they, they saw me in a uniform. They had that fear, that worry coming over them. Same thing with my wife. And um, I was like, why am I torturing them with this? Uh, why, why do I have to keep doing this? Um, and so I started looking for ways that I might be able to get out of the military early, um, usually you know, unless there's like a medical reason, uh, or you've completely screwed up and you've, uh, you know, committed some crimes or things like that, you usually don't get out of the military early, but the army had a, um, a regulation called surviving sons and daughters. And that was designed for people like me who had a, 
uh, a loved one who was in the service and lost their lives while serving. Um, so my brother losing his life made me qualify to be able to be discharged under the surviving sons and daughters uh, regulation. And so it was about June of 2011 when I actually got out of the military. Um, my enlistment was going to be over in November, but it, that just kind of saved my family the next few months of seeing me going into training, getting in the uniform all over again and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and like I said, I, I wasn't doing anything anyways. So it was really just going there, sitting there and collecting a paycheck. And that didn't feel right to me either. So, um, so yeah, I ended up getting out, let's see, eight or so months, uh, nine months after uh, coming back from Afghanistan. And, and I was glad that I was done at that point. Um, Cause I, I just didn't have that passion anymore for what I was doing. Um, it just kind of didn't seem like it was worth it anymore. Uh, after losing my brother, I, I just didn't feel like I was going to be the best leader, the best soldier that I could be. And it, it was just good that I was able to part ways at that point. Yeah, and it's great that they have that surviving sons and daughters to be able to do that and be able to then focus on yourself as well and realize like what's best for you, what's best for your comrades. Right, exactly. So now this is an audio only podcast, but since we are on a video call, I can see your background and you've got like medals and things like that up on the wall. So can you share a little bit about what those are? Yeah, sure. So the the medals that are over my my shoulder here, uh, those are my medals that I earned uh, through my service. Um, and so in that box has everything that's related to me and my service. Um, the flag that's above it is actually a flag that flew over the Capitol for uh, my brother. And so my my parents, um, they had they had the flag that was over my brother's casket and they had receive so many different things from different people that they gave me that flag so I could have kind of a, a piece of uh, that to remember him by. Um, there are uh, some paintings on the other side here where um, after coming back, I found uh, art therapy to be helpful for my PTSD uh, to help me kind of focus on something other than the crap that was running through my head. And so um, I've, I've done a bunch of paintings that has really helped me um, while I'm painting to kind of focus on something other than, um, than the, the stresses that I, I've been going through. Um, let's see, just, I'm trying to take a look at what's behind me too. Um, there's a, a photograph uh, right here that I'm pointing at um, that the people can't necessarily see, but, um, the, the photograph is of, uh, me, my parents and, uh, president Trump and first lady, uh, Melania Trump, um, at the white house. Um, we were invited, our family was invited to the white house, uh, as part of a, uh, gold star family reception that they had there. Um, and, uh, every year, uh, president Trump invited 50, uh, gold star families and, uh, gold star families are ones that have lost a loved one in uh, service uh, in the military service. And uh, so we, we were able to meet the, the president and the first lady, and they had held a ceremony um, to basically remember and honor the, these people uh, who had given their lives. And, and so it was, to me, it was one of those once in a lifetime experiences. You don't get invited to the white house every day. Uh, and so I was like, well, of course I'm going to go like that. Like that's, that's awesome. You know? Um, and so we were able to do that. Um, and you know, it, it, to me, it was, that was right around the time that I decided to start the podcast and write my book, um, because it, it just kind of sparked something in me. Like there's, there's more to it than just my, uh, my service, my sacrifice and my, uh, thing that I, I was doing. Like I thought about why I wasn't even invited to the white house. Um, it wasn't because of anything that I did. It was because of something that my brother did. And, you know, yes, our family sacrificed something uh, when we lost my brother, but um, but it was all because of him. And so uh, I felt like I needed to serve something that was bigger than myself. And in that way, I was able to uh, give back to the overall veteran and military community by 
having this podcast and giving back that way and writing my book um, to help out other people who might be experiencing something similar as, as what I went through. So um, that's really kind of the spark that started a lot of this for me. Uh, and rarely do you say no to the White House. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I do want to know, though, did you paint at all before doing the art therapy? Not since like, elementary school art class or whatever. Like I hadn't picked up a paintbrush in any serious kind of way. Um, like other than, you know, painting the walls in my house or something, um, you know, never any, I never really had any artistic skills or talents or anything. And, um, I, I had actually talked to a friend of mine who, who I served with in Afghanistan, who told me how he started, uh, started painting and it really helped him in his PTSD. Uh, and he moved on to other forms of artwork too, that, that also helped him. Um, but he told me about that and I was like, well, that kind of sounds fun. And so let me give it a try. Worst case scenario, I totally suck at it and I just throw it away and like no one ever has to see it and it doesn't matter. Um, and the first thing is I, I few things I did weren't all that great, but as I was doing it, I kind of got a better feel for it. And I was like, I'm kind of enjoying this and the stuff doesn't look half bad either. So like, I might as well keep doing it. And, and so I, I had been doing it for, for quite a while. I, I sort of took a break recently. Um, just I had a lot of other things going on in, in my life. I just didn't, didn't really have the time for it. But when I've done the painting and the artwork, I, it really did help me to, just kind of forget about things and so no i hadn't painted uh really anything before um but i kind of stumbled into it so i, I guess you know if anyone's out there thinking about uh trying something like that not sure if it's going to work like who cares just try it yeah and it's very impressive now Thank you. you're welcome now, where are you sort of on the like journey of dealing with PTSD and just like mental health in general? You know, I learned along the way that the mental health journey is more of a marathon, not a sprint. Um, it's it's not like um, not like something where if you were to break your arm or leg or something, you go to the doctor, you get a cast on, it gets healed, and then cast comes off, life is good, you go about your life like it never happened almost, you know, usually. And you don't typically have to go following up with the doctor to make sure that it's still not broken because, you know, unless you did anything else, like it's not going to be broken. Um, but with the mental health, it's a little bit different. Um, when I first went to talk to someone, uh, I was, I went to see them for almost two years and it helped, uh, to the point where I thought I could probably just handle things on my own. I didn't really need to go talk to anyone anymore. So I stopped going and I was okay for a little while. And then I noticed that I started to slip into some of the old habits that I had. Um, I was, uh, I was getting frustrated and angry at, at things the way I, I was, like I described in Afghanistan, uh, when I was just angry at those people, I was angry at things for really no reason. Um, I was drinking too much and sleeping too little. And that's just a perfect recipe for a disaster. And, you know, I was, I started finding myself slipping back into some of those old habits and, and I realized, okay, clearly whatever I thought had worked hadn't fully worked or if it had worked, um, you know, it, it didn't stick. And so I need to continue working on this and to be fully transparent, I'm still, uh, going to get help in counseling for my PTSD, uh, through the VA and in dealing with it, um, you know, one day at a time, really. Um, there's some days I, I have good days and I, I feel great and nothing's bothering me or, or whatever. And then other days I have absolutely terrible days, uh, where, with with PTSD, sometimes you get the the flashbacks, like they talk about in the movies, where where you're literally you feel like you're reliving a certain experience, where you feel like you're back in wherever that traumatic experience took place. In my my case, it fe actually feels like I'm back in Afghanistan, where I feel the weight of the body armor, I feel the the weight of the rifle in my hands, I I can see the 
the same things that I saw. I smell things. I can feel the heat uh, from uh, like everything just feels the same. Um, and that's that's something that I've had to learn how to deal with and, and kind of cope with. Um, and it's it's not easy. It still still affects me from time to time. Um, it gets better over time, but you know it hasn't fully gone away. And this is almost twelve years since I got home now. And so, um, you know, I, I just want to encourage people who might be listening to this who might have experienced a trauma of some sort. It doesn't have to be combat. It could be a a car accident, or it could be an assault, or it could be any number of things. Like it's okay to keep working through this. Um, don't just quit because you feel like you've done everything that you could and nothing's working. Well, uh, it, it is a, a marathon and we all run our marathons at different rates. Um, and some of us finish much quicker than others. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's okay if you're, you're going to keep on going through, but, but you'll never finish if you just quit. So, you know, keep, keep going at it. That's some really great advice, and I appreciate you sharing all of that. Sure. Now, there are plenty of things that I could still ask you, but of course, you know, we can't keep recording for hours and hours, but I do want to give you the chance, if there's anything else specific you would like to share with the listeners to do that now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I appreciate, uh, again, this opportunity to be on your show. Um, uh, for the listeners, um, you know, I encourage you, like I was saying earlier, if you feel like something's just not right, um, and you, maybe you don't even know why it's not right, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling, feeling anxious, or uh, things are triggering you, loud noises or smells or sounds, or, you know, other things like that, that that are happening, go talk to someone. And someone, you know, who is a mental health professional, it's okay. Um, a lot of what I do on my podcast is trying to reduce that stigma of, uh, people going to talk to a mental health uh, therapist, a, a psychologist or whatever. Um, it's okay. Like there's, there's nothing wrong. If your car, if you're driving around in your car and it starts making this weird, funky clunking noise, you're probably going to go take it to a mechanic unless you know how to fix cars yourself. And no one's going to look at you like, Oh my God, you're nuts. How, why would you bring your car to a mechanic? Like, obviously you're going to do that because if you don't, the car's going to end up breaking down and you're not going to have a car to drive. Same thing with you. If you can't, figure out what's wrong with yourself and fix it yourself, go talk to someone who can and they'll help you figure it out because eventually you're going to have a, a mind that's just not going to be functioning at its full potential. So um, th those are kind of my, uh, I guess, my words of wisdom, if, if you will. I don't know how, uh, how much wisdom is in there, but uh, hopefully it helps somebody uh, to hear that. Um, as far as um, my book, uh, my book again is uh, called Surviving Son, which is named after that regulation that I talked about, Surviving Sons and Daughters. Um, since I was the surviving son, I decided to name the book Surviving Sons. So uh, you can get that on Amazon in pretty much any format that you uh, want to read it. Uh, there, there's a Kindle uh, ebook, there's a paperback hardcover, and I recently released the audio book, which I recorded myself. So uh, if you can stand the sound of my voice, uh, the audio book might be good for you. Um, uh, and then my my podcast, again, if you can stand my voice, is, uh, is at uh, driveonpodcast.com. Great. And I will make sure to leave all that information in the description as well. Now, at the end of all of my episodes with my guests, I do ask a random question that doesn't have to do with anything that we've talked about. So we'll see if this applies to you. What do you secretly hoard? Oh, secretly hoard. Um, well, I don't know if it's secretly. Um, I mean, it's not public, but my wife certainly knows about it. Um, it I have clothes from years and years and years ago. I just can't seem to bring myself to, to toss them. Um, my wife actually earlier this week was like, we're going through the closet this weekend and we're going to make a goodwill package and we're going to drop it all off because there's stuff in there that hasn't fit me for a few years. And I don't know if it's just wishful thinking that eventually I'll fit back into it, but, um, you know, so I, I think that's probably one of the, the biggest things with me is I, I just don't get rid of them for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> I 
All right, that brings this episode to a close. As I mentioned, I will be leaving those links for Scott in the description. So a direct link to both his podcast website and his books website, which then of course takes you to more links, social media, and all of the good things you could possibly want relating to Scott's book and his podcast. And of course, if you'd like to connect with our podcast here, the website is in the description that takes you to all of our social media, past episodes, all the resources from past guests. So feel free to go check those out and follow those social media pages. And if you would like to connect with me, my email is in the description as well. I always love having new guests and there is a link to support the podcast monetarily in the description if you would like to do that. So thank you so much, Scott, for spending time with me today. And of course, your service in the military. And thank you to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate this, uh, being able to come on and share my story with you and your audience.